You are Locked On Balls, your daily podcast on the Tennessee Volunteers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what is up, everybody? Happy Friday, and welcome back into it. This is Locked On Balls, a part of the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm your host, Eric Kane. You can always find me on Twitter at underscore Kaner. Find this podcast on Twitter at Locked On Balls, and uh, you can find it on YouTube every single day. So go ahead and pound that like button, subscribe if you haven't already, and of course, any of your audio listening devices, your platforms, completely free. Go ahead and subscribe there as well. Got a fun show coming up today. I've got my buddy Boogie Bentley coming on, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna talk with Boogie here in segments one and two. A big win to recap for the Alabama, and then we're gonna get our official preview of UT Martin coming up later in the show. But you see him right there. There he is, Boogie. What's up, brother? Man, I feel like we have been celebrating for six days. It, did you wait a second? A breakdown? Did you say there's a football game on Saturday? It does not feel like Tennessee is playing football on Saturday. But man, here we are, halfway in, six and zero, six and zero, and I think the toughest part of the schedule is behind us, man. Dude, I, I'm not gonna lie. Like, I, football background, I, I know not to underestimate any opponent. Always give each opponent respect and everything. But I swear to God, I have treated this week <laughs> like it's a bye week. I really have, and I know that's wrong of me. Like, like yesterday, I'm sitting here and like I'm recording. I'm like, oh yeah, Tennessee plays UT Martin. Like, I need to give a breakdown of what Jason Simpson's club does, which I'm going to do here today. But it's been one of those weeks, man. I mean, there's tons of things to celebrate because, of course, Tennessee knocks off Alabama for the first time in 15 tries. Yeah, I mean, you got to celebrate that, right? I mean, 15 years, 15 long years and that's kind of been the theme that we've been talking about over on the talking balls network is is it's more than that man it's more than that and alabama fans they are mad they are crying they are upset and it's like they want to throw shade and kind of i don't know kind of dampen the win and like oh it's you're just celebrating just because you beat alabama no we're celebrating 15 years of losing to alabama we're we're celebrating a coach that finally gets it all these failed coaching searches and false hope is all in the rearview mirror tennessee's got their head coach and that's why we're celebrating. That's why we're tearing. I told you, Eric, I told you last week, we're tearing down the goalposts and we're throwing them in the river where they belong, and that's exactly what happened on Saturday evening. Well, you, you knew for a fact if Tennessee was going to win this football game that the goalposts were coming down. They were going to make their way outside of Neyland Stadium. At one point when I, at, during the post-game festivities, I'm on the field. I look up. And towards the top of the the lower bowl, I mean that that uprights making its way up the stands, and then it, and then it comes back down. They're trying to figure out a way to get it out of the stadium. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. There's a video out there on YouTube where you can it says follow the journey of the goalpost, and they take it through the stadium out. It shows it marching down the street. They use different people's social media clips and put together the story of it until it finally ends up in the river where it belongs. And, and let me let me let me say this. I mean, we have a platform, so I can say this a little bit. I, I haven't done this anywhere. Like. You know, there there was a big old chunk of a sod taken out of the north end zone. Hey, like I, the field, all things considered, it, it looked just fine. Okay, it looked just fine. That one chunk of sod, it's not the end of the world. They have so much other sod. Like it, it, seriously, it's the easiest fix in the world. It's not a big deal. So if you're watching or listening and you have a little chunk of grass, one of my buddies does. So I know he's listening right now. <laughs> like, hey, good for you. That's cool. <laughs> I mean, you, you preserve that thing. You know, frame it. Do whatever you got to do. I don't know. I don't know how you do all that. But if you got some type of artifact, like you know, piece of the goalpost, good for you, man. I mean, that that's that that's that's history right there. I mean, I, I'd love to have a piece of that, wouldn't you? Enjoying the moment, man. Enjoying the moment. Think about people that in 98 when they stormed the field, and it's like people that have that stuff, now it's celebrated. But, you know, I see people complaining, saying, what are you doing destroying your field? It's like, no, no. We'll forget all about destroying anything 20 years from now when we look back and remember where we were at, who we were with. Just such a huge win for this football team, the fan base, the program, the athletes, everybody. You know what that reminds me of? I'm I'm such a nerd, but Charles Lindbergh, you ever heard of him? Uh Uh-uh. Okay, so it flew the first continual flight from, uh, okay, this is bad on history. It was either from England over the Atlantic to the United States or vice versa, from New York over the pond. It's the first continual flight or whatever. And whenever the flight landed, people were mobbing it and taking pieces of the plane and breaking it off. That's kind of what that reminded yeah. me of a little bit. <laughs> not as um, not as uh, impressive as that, obviously, but... Uh, anyway, I mean, w- w- what a win. Uh, again, we, you and I were kind of talking about it earlier in the week, man. But, like, we, we kind of reset every single week. Like, what is the expectations now moving forward for this team? So, 
you know, for me, I kind of answer this for you, and, and maybe I'm living in the moment, but again, I'm not. I mean, you got to take every game seriously, but the absolute floor for this football team right now is 10 and 2 to the Sugar Bowl. I mean, there's that, it's, that's fact, right? I mean, am I wrong here? Yeah, and let and you know, look, I took some flack and spoiler alert, I, I said that Tennessee was gonna have an Alabama hangover this weekend. I, I just don't see how you avoid that. Yeah, but yeah. you know, history has told us that Josh is gonna have this team prepared and ready to go. And when you look at the schedule, Kentucky and Georgia, that that's the floor, that's the ten and two you're talking about. Outside of that, I mean Tennessee should just go take care of business in the ceiling. Like, you know, some people say it at the beginning of the year, this team's going 12-0, and and you just kind of laugh it off, right? It's they like, say okay, that every single year. Right, yeah. right. You hear it every year, people say that. And now here we are at the midway point, and again, I think the toughest part of the schedule is behind us, and it's like 12-0 and is a reality. And, and you can say, I, I've said all year, I think Georgia's the best football team in the country. Uh, people can argue, debate, whatever, it's fine. I think they're a good football team. Uh, but Tennessee can realistically go and beat Georgia. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt about it whatsoever because – and that game's going to be huge. And, and the game right before that with Kentucky is going to be huge. I think Kentucky's a little bit overrated, but still, I, I catch a lot of flack all the time because I think Kentucky's a solid football program with Mark Stoops, and I still think that. I mean, Kentucky's the type of team that'll beat, that'll beat you up if you don't come ready to play. That's why I think the schedule sets up so well because if there is – an Alabama type hangover. And I know what you're saying, man. It's hard to avoid it, right? I mean, you're just, you're coming off your biggest win in 15 years. Um, you know, we'll, we'll see if there actually is one, but if there is, obviously it's understandable. But then if there is one, it's, it's UT Martin. You can afford to not be your best self in, in a game against an FCS opponent. But obviously, that's not going to fly with the coaching staff. But if that is the case, you're, you're lucky that you have UT Martin this week. Yeah, it almost sets up better for the coaching staff. And look, when I say a, a hangover against UT Martin, people are getting so mad at me. Uh, you're still going to win stream. by 40, 45 or something. Yeah. You're, you're still going to take it. You're just going to give up some points. You're going to give up some points. And look, that UT Martin football team, they score some points, and they like to throw the football around. And what's Tennessee's weakness? Pass defense. I, I think they'll make some plays. Tennessee wins the game. It's never in doubt. We're never nervous. We're never anxious. Uh, but it, it's going to be a good teaching point for this coaching staff when they can go back and watch the tape and say you got Kentucky coming up this week this is what you did against UT Martin we've got better athletes better talent you guys have to be better than this or we're not going to be ready to finish this season I, I, that's just the way I see it playing out maybe they come out and, and just boat race UT Martin right out of the door right out of the gate like they have and again Josh Heibel's history tells us they're going to take care of Ball State and Akron and they're going to take care of UT Martin I don't think we have to worry about it but that's just what I'm that's the way I see it my favorite quote from Josh Heupel this week, and he said it twice. He said it to us Monday in the media, then he said it on um, the SEC teleconference on Wednesday. He said the players got a good dose of reality back in that meeting room watching the tape with their position coaches. Obviously, nothing's perfect. I mean, you know, especially defensively, there's a lot to get in there. But I, I love that mindset. Obviously, you're going to get that mindset from a coaching staff. But, like, you know, you hear Jalen Hyatt speak. You hear Hinton Hooker speak. You hear Princeton fans speak. You hear – you know, Amari Thomas speak. It's just like they want to continue to get better and better each and every week because they know, hey, you just beat Alabama. And like there were still a lot of areas in areas, areas, areas in your game to where, gosh, if you would have sharpened up some things here and there, maybe you could have won by a touchdown. Maybe you could have been so much better in that game. I just I still think this team has not played to its fullest potential defensively for sure. Um, and that's kind of scary for a six and ball club. Yeah, and I, I, it all starts at the top, right? It all yeah. starts with Josh Heupel, and even Rodney Garner's the same way. Like, that dude's never happy, which is amazing. Uh, no matter what that defensive line unit does, he's never going to give him a, a ton of praise. He's always going to talk about what they need to fix and get better. And, you know, Josh Heupel, the confidence that he brings, and that's something that I, I've told this story on, on my show multiple times this week. But it's just funny because when the scoop and score, right, us as Vol fans, battered Vol syndrome, whatever you want to call it, we all say, well, it was a good effort, but here we go again, another loss to Alabama. And I went upstairs to get a drink, and my wife's like, you think they're going to lose, don't you? And I said, yeah, I do. Like, I do, because that's the way it always happens. And, like, she's, we're going back and forth talking, whatever, and I'm like, all right, I got to get back downstairs. And as I get ready to walk out, I turn around, and I say, hold on a second. One last thing. I may not be confident, but there is a guy leading that football team in Josh Heupel that truly believes they are going to win that game after the scoop and score. And that, that's something that I love. You know, you look at what he did throughout the game, his, his facial expressions, his actions, the way he carried himself, up 21-7 early, never batted an eye, had the same look of, of focus, the missed extra point by Chase McGrath. That's a moment where you can freak out and panic. Never bats an eye. Under eight minutes to play. That's when the scoop and score happens. Tied at 42. 
Alabama takes the lead. Nothing. My favorite moment in that football game was when Alabama missed the field goal with 15 seconds left. Derek Dooley, Butch Jones, Jeremy, they would have all hit their knees yep. and celebrated. Josh Heibel didn't celebrate. He turned and said, all right, here's what we're going to do. He's, he's moving on. The second they missed, he's moving on to what they need to do to go win the football game. And we truly have a leader in Josh Heupel, and that's the difference in this football team. No doubt about it. Tennessee's got a head football coach. His name is Josh Heupel, and uh, uh, he's a good one. I mean, he really, really is a good one. Hey, more on this Alabama win, more on what's to come tomorrow against UT Martin with Boogie Bentley of the Talking Vols Network over on YouTube. Go ahead and subscribe if you haven't already. Hey, this episode is brought to you in part by Underdog Fantasy. It's the easiest place to spice up college football this season. Easy to get started, easy to play while you're, of course, watching your favorite team play um, on uh, on Sunday or Saturday or whatever. Hey, my favorite NFL team, it is the Tennessee Titans, okay? Tennessee is playing up a big divisional matchup this weekend against the Colts Sunday, 1 o'clock Eastern. I got Ryan Tannehill. The number set right now is 225 and a half, excuse me, 222 yards and a half. So I'm going to go the under there. Ryan Tannehill He's a lot of things. Um, he's won a lot of games for Tennessee, but he's been efficient at times without, you know, throwing his right arm out, right? He doesn't have to throw for 300 yards for Tennessee to win. A lot of that has to do with Derrick Henry in the backfield, or at least the threat of Derrick Henry. But the over-under is set at 222 passing yards and a half for Ryan Tannehill. Give me the under on that one. Tennessee's won a lot of big games when Ryan Tannehill's not had to throw for over 250 yards. So I like the under right there, and that is an underdog fantasy. You can find more higher or lower uh, total selections for your favorite team at Underdog Fantasy. Um, tons and tons of uh, different options you can have, and it's available in 30 states. Just pick between two and five players across any team as well, not just your team, and decide if they're going to finish higher or lower. So I took Ryan Danhill in one of those. There's a Derrick Henry option. Uh, there's a tons and tons of other plays for just that Titans-Colts game, and you have more across the NFL as well. It's one of the easiest fantasy games to play out there, and you can win some cold, hard cash in a single game. So uh, sign up with the promo code locked on. That's one word locked on and underdog will get, will double your first deposit up to $100. So again, if you put in a hundred dollars, they're going to give you a hundred dollars as well. Go to underdogfantasy.com or find the underdog fantasy app in the app store or Google play store. That's underdog fantasy promo code locked on one word locked on. Get in the college football pick on action today with underdog fantasy. It's a fun Friday show right here on Locked On Vols. Welcome back into it. We're talking with our guy Boogie Bentley of Talking Vols. And of course, UT Martin coming up tomorrow. Uh, Tennessee looking to go seven and oh. Uh you, you're talking about Josh Heupel, Boogie, right before we sit we hit the reset there. I, I just feel like his personality. Um, this team plays their hearts out for these coaches. That was not the case for Jeremy Pruitt. That was not the case for Butch Jones. At points in times it might have been, but it wasn't for uh, the majority of the time. And, and Jalen Hyatt said it about Kelsey Pope. You know, uh, Latrell Bump has said about Rodney Gardner. Um, Aaron Beasley said it about Brian Jean Marie. I mean, these guys love playing for these coaches. And, and, you know, when they, when you finally get wins, like, you know, a lot of times when you're like five and seven or seven and five or whatever, it's just like, okay, that's cute. That's fine. But when you're knocking off Alabama, I feel like that type of love and compassion for your coaches makes the buy-in even more, makes the practice sessions even better. Um, and obviously it helps result in some wins. Yeah, I mean, you talk about your mindset, right? And Josh Heupel talked about it earlier in the year, thinking you can win, wanting to win, expecting to win. There's a difference in all of that. And I always think it's fascinating, right, when you're talking about sports, athletics, how much does mindset actually play into it? But, you know, we're fortunate, especially you. I I'm kind of dipping my toe into this thing. Like, we are fortunate to get to talk about Tennessee athletics for a living. And yeah, I'm still kind of that 50-50, still got my toe in the water over here in business. Dude, and your still... YouTube page kicks <laughs> mine's ass. What are you yes, talking about? I'm, just, I'm, I'm close, man. I'm close to being able to do this for a living. But a lot yeah. of people that listen to us, you know, that they're, they're working that 9 to 5. They're working in offices and they're listening to us. That's why they like the morning show, man, because they can turn it on and listen. And when you compare that, and that's what I can look at is leadership. The difference between a manager and a leader and that's why I went out of that world and into this world full-time because 
if you don't have a leader, if you just got a manager, and that's what I compare Jeremy Pruitt to, like a, like a drill sergeant, he's just going to bark at you. Not everybody responds to that. And when Josh Heupel came in and he was doing all the leadership things, and you know, I love the fact that he came in and the first thing he did was listen. He sat down and said, what yeah. do you need? And, and people need to be managed or coached differently, and it's just authentic, it's real. And I truly believe, I truly, truly believe that it's because Josh Heupel has been there, done that. He's done it at an elite level. And I love the comparisons of the article that came out from The Athletic a couple of weeks ago, a week ago, uh, talking about Red October, you know, back when Josh Heupel came to Oklahoma and and they go seven and five. And then he sits down with his team and says, hey, we're going to win a national championship. And they're like, okay, pump the brakes, calm down a little bit. And it's like the comparisons to then and now. And Josh Heupel can say, look what I did. And he he, he just gets it, man. He just gets it. And he is a true leader. We're, We're fortunate, man. We as Tennessee fans need to be appreciative of what we have in a football coach right now. Yeah, I mean, Danny White did the same thing, too. Whenever Danny White was hired as AD, he sat down with the leadership committee and said, hey, who do you want in a football coach? Like, wh- wh- what do you want? And and again, this is – I mean, this is how – it's how you do things. But, like, whenever he introduced Josh Heupel, he was like, Josh Heupel was our first pick. No, he wasn't. He was like yeah. four, five, six. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't matter. Like, he's yep. here. I mean, that, that's that, that's just how these things work out, right? Uh, you know, Lane – USC picked Lane, like, seventh on their list whenever he left Tennessee after one year. I mean, that's usually how things work out. But – Man, uh, Josh Heupel and Danny White, they are they are great together. Uh, they they truly, truly are. And so for Tennessee this year now, you're 6-0. You have a win over Alabama. The college football playoff rankings, those first ones will come out first in November. Um, Tennessee will have yet to have played Georgia at that time, I believe. Or maybe it'll come out right after that game. I can't remember. Um, anyway, Tennessee's got – actually, no, it won't because you got UT Martin, then you got Kentucky, and then you got – okay, yeah. Sorry, the schedule. Georgia this late in the year is kind of weird. It is weird. It's odd. Yeah, it is odd, but um, I just look at Tennessee, man, and all bets are off. I said this right after the game against Alabama. I said, if you play up to, to, to your standard, all bets are off. You can certainly run the table if you want to. You can go to Atlanta. You can be in the college football playoff, and it's just wild to think about because, again, you know, we talk about Tennessee football every single day. You know, We cover the team, so I know, you know more so than just the common fan, and that, that's not like barking down. It's just I know it's ingrained in my memory to say, Tennessee is just truly awful at the star position. They have no backup there. Or, you know, just an example like that. But even though, like, e- even with those deficiencies, it's such a strong team that it can overcome that. It's just, it's just, it's wild to think about Tennessee beating Alabama, I guess, is what I'm rambling on about. It's just, it's been a fun year. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when you sit back, like you said, and, and it's not talking down, it's just saying the casual fan. And look, a lot of people that are tuned in to my, what I'm doing, what you're doing, some of these people are, are just as insane as we are. Oh, yeah. They dive in, they can tell you the depth chart. And, they call and me but, out and tell me when I'm wrong. And I'm like, yeah, you know what? You're right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 But it's like when, when you look at the, the reality and you look at where this team was at when Josh Eibel took over, and you know the numbers of people that transferred out in Tennessee, not even having a full roster of scholarship players. You, like, sometimes it comes off as I feel like I'm bashing players. I don't want it to feel like I'm bashing players. What happens when Josh Heupel gets his guy? And I love Hendon Hooker. Good gosh, I love me some Hendon Hooker. What happens when five-star Nico Eyal Maliava comes and develops and gets better? What happens if a guy like Carnell Tate shows up on campus and develops? Cam Seldon gets here. What happens when Josh Heupel overhauls this roster? What what is the what's the ceiling then? We're talking about national championships in year two from a depleted roster. Like you said, the star position, the secondary. Look at the linebacker room just a year ago. I mean, we're talking about the long snapper, Will Albright, taking valuable spring reps at linebacker because there just was not depth there. And they still have depth issues, but they find a way. They believe this team believes they can win, and that's why they upset Alabama. That's why they have an opportunity to go to Atlanta, and that's why they have an opportunity to go win a national championship also i just used the star position tennessee is actually pretty good at the backup star position with wesley walker but anyway i just wanted to someone's probably saying so what are you talking about yeah it's star? coming it's <laughs> just an example uh, also too like somebody somebody said something along those lines to me as well and i completely agree with what you just said uh, but for a guy who covers recruiting it's so important to find talent of course and uh to be a good evaluator i mean look at nathan laycock he has shot up yes. what a great evaluation there you know from tennessee staff um but also like so much more of it is just development, man. And like you know this, but like look what look what Heupel's done with a uh, Cedric Tillman who was nothing before him. Look what uh, Jeremy Pruitt brought in Hendon Hooker, which is just so funny to me. I love it. everyone's like, oh, I love Hendon Hooker. Thank Jeremy Pruitt for that. But would he be the same guy with Jim Chaney and Jeremy Pruitt? No, he wouldn't because it's about 
that one system, that one coach that, you know, it clicked. It's about development. I mean, Hendon Hooker, Cedric Tillman, look at, uh, I don't know, there's countless, uh, Latrell Bump. I mean, there's there's countless other examples of that. And I just think that Heupel and, and his coaches are really good developers. And so, I mean, sure, some are better than not. I mean, there's there needs to be a little bit more development in the secondary. We can all agree there. But that's just one of those things that's most impressive with me. So, uh, hey, UT Martin coming up tomorrow. What are you wanting to see from Tennessee? Who are you wanting to see? Maybe a young guy step up. What are you? What are you looking for tomorrow? I, I want to see them prove me wrong. I want them to come out, play clean football, put UT Martin away early. I want to see Joe Milton in the second half. I, I want to see Joe continue to develop. That's something that I'm excited about. To not, I'm still enjoying the ride in 2022. But when we look ahead to next season, I, I want to see what Joe Milton can truly do. And I want, I just want to continue to see him get time, get opportunities, get a chance to go out there and show you what he's made him. of. Sorry to cut you off. You want him to start every single game next year. Yes, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. And and people want to talk about Nico, and I get it. I'm excited about Nico, too. But Joe Milton has a huge, huge NFL potential, more so than Hendon Hooker. Don't don't tweet at me. Don't tweet at me and harass me. And here's That's the, thing. the truth. It's He's the right. truth. He's right. Yeah. He he. The sky is the limit for Joe Milton. Can he dial it in? I'm excited to see. I want to see him on Saturday. And like I said, just a clean football game. Rotate guys in. Some of those young running backs, maybe we see uh, a little bit more Dylan Sampson, who's kind of not been out there much since the injury. Uh, but, but that's it, man. And, and, and I'll, I'll be honest, I've not dove into UT Martin at all. All this week. I know they score a lot of points. I know they score almost 40 points a game, and I know they like to throw the football. I don't care. Tennessee should be able to go line up without watching any film, without formulating any game plan, and just dominate UT Martin on Saturday. My old my old football playing self would just be disgusted with who I am right now this week because every Sunday I make a huge scouting report, two pages on the next opponent, and I use it to write articles, and I use it as reference throughout the week and everything. I mean, look how clean and neat this sheet of paper is if you're watching on YouTube. I've not touched it since Sunday. And we're we're gonna touch it coming up here in segment three as we officially preview UT Martin. Uh, but you know it's uh, it is what it is. Tennessee, as you pointed out, Tennessee should dominate this game. Tennessee should be seven and zero heading into Kentucky. And uh, again, it's uh, the the fun season will continue. Uh, is is what's gonna happen? So Boogie, appreciate it, man. Uh, what what's what can we have uh, looking forward to coming up uh, over the weekend? I know you guys do a post game show, obviously after Tennessee's game. It'll be a little early afternoon post game show this Saturday, right? Yeah, I don't think it'll quite be the celebration of last Saturday. But, uh, yeah, we'll be live immediately after the game. Always a good time. Interactive, man. The point of our show is not to be professional. We're, we're not we're not experts, all that stuff. Like, what you do, all those notes you just showed. I don't know that people realize how much work that guys like you, guys like Ben McKee who came on the show last week. Ben McKee went off the show, and so many people messaged me and was like, holy cow, man, he just re- – you guys put so much time and effort and energy, and I don't think a lot of people realize how hard you guys do work. We're not professionals. We're psychotic fans. It's like sitting on the deck with your buddies cracking open a beer and talking Tennessee football. So join us live immediately after the game on the Talking Vols Network uh, on YouTube. We would appreciate it. Always if a good time. If you haven't already, please subscribe over there. They continue to have great numbers. Subscribe to the Talking Vols Network on YouTube. Do a fantastic job. And, of course, I join once every week, usually on, uh, on Monday mornings as well. And Boogie... Over here on Lockdown Balls every Friday. So it's been a whole lot of fun. Boogie, appreciate it, man. And uh, have a great weekend, all right? Thanks, buddy. All right. That'll do it here for this uh, portion of Lockdown Balls. Boogie Bentley, an awesome job there, as always. And like I said, hey, we're going to come back. We're going to look at UT Martin. We're going to see who are the Skyhawks for the first time this week. Apologies, but better late than never. I'll tell you all about Jason Simpson's club, who won the Ohio Valley Conference a year ago. That's coming up next right here on Lockdown Balls. One more segment left here on this week's Locked on Vols. I'm Eric Kent. Thank you guys for hanging out with me here today. Good stuff as always from my guy Boogie Bentley over at Talking Vols. Let's talk UT Martin now. We have not all week long. And like I said with uh, with Boogie, like sometimes I feel bad about that. But you guys want to talk Alabama. You guys want to talk big picture. It's not like Tennessee's playing Kentucky this week, right? If Tennessee was playing Kentucky this week, I would have spent a whole lot more time getting some guests on. They cover Kentucky and, and previewing that matchup. But Tennessee's playing UT Martin. Another benefit of this schedule, I think the schedule has really worked out nicely for Tennessee in that regard to where you get kind of a breather, right? Um, and that's really, really good. But who is UT Martin? All right, well, UT Martin's 4-2 and two on the season. They're 3-0 and oh in the Ohio Valley Conference. Uh, they are uh, an FCS ball club, Tennessee, Power Fives, Group of Fives. Those are FBS. 
Um, this is an FCS program, all right? But they are four and two. They've won four, they've won three games in a row since losing to Boise State back on September the uh, the 17th. They lost 30 to seven in that regard. They also lost to Missouri State 35 30. But since then, they beat Lindenwood, Tennessee Tech, and Murray State. I don't, I've never heard of Lindenwood, so your guess is as good as mine. But anyway, uh, this team won the Ohio Valley Conference a season ago. First time, I believe, in program history that that happened. It's coached by Jason Simpson. Jason Simpson is the father of Alabama reserve quarterback Ty Simpson, uh, formerly a big time quarterback prospect uh, that was considering the University of Tennessee. Uh, Jason Simpson was in house at Neyland Stadium watching Tennessee take down. Alabama because, of course, his son, Ty Simpson, was dressed and very much could have played in that football game. Of course, Bryce Young came in and he played. He played well, so that wasn't needed. But Jason Simpson was in-house, so he got an up-close uh, and personal look at the University of Tennessee. And, um, of course, you go back and you, you watch the film and you get a better picture of it. But, uh, nonetheless, he was there. And I got to say, like, I know these games are – um it's a hot button uh, issue for fans because you get tired of them. You, you just say, Hey, drop those games. Go, go, go get another power five game, you know, add another conference game, yada, yada, yada. We want big boy football. And I agree. I mean, there's nothing appealing about this type of football game because Tennessee should wax them. But let me just tell you like th for, for the, for the health of the sports, you need these types of games. And I think Jason since was actually quoted in some article this week, I, um, I don't know what the article was, and therefore I'm not going to go into his direct quote. But, I mean, it's essentially saying just that. I mean, my thoughts is you want football to be a sport available for so many kids. So you want the opportunities to be there. If you don't have these pay games, you know, I don't know what the number is, but you have, you have UT Martin that's going to get paid a crap ton of money to come up here and get their brains beat in by the University of Tennessee. That's just a fact. You're getting paid to do that. You know what that check does? It funds every bus trip. It funds every hotel bill. It funds every uniform expense. It funds for that program to stay alive. If you didn't have these pay games, these lower level football programs would not exist. Therefore, you might not be able to go get play. It means I couldn't go and play at Carson Newman, the division two. Like, you know, it just, it opens up so many different opportunities for everybody. So I love these football games because I love football and it's important to keep those opportunities alive for anybody that has a chance to go and further your career, get an education, play a sport you love. It's very important, but that's kind of what this football game is. All right, on to the Skyhawks real quick. Uh, it's a football team that's got an explosive offense, all right? Very much like Tennessee in a sense of where it's got a really good offense, got a defense that will allow you to hang around a little bit. Points per game, 37.5 points per game for UT Martin. Opponents are averaging 26 points a game on its defense. Uh, total offense, 485 yards of total offense from UT Martin. Pretty good. Opponents are averaging 379 yards of total offense. Uh, average per play in terms of yards, UT Martin's gaining about 7.3 yards per play. Opponents, 5.6. Uh, passing offense, UT Martin's averaging a hair under 300 yards a game at 297. Opponents are throwing for 267 yards against UT Martin's defense. That's what's really similar about Tennessee and UT Martin. Uh, rushing offense, the Skyhawks run for 188 yards on offense per game. Opponents are running for 112. That's a pretty respectable number uh, in terms of defense, I mean. Uh, yards per carry, 6.3 yards per tote for UT Martin, 3.3 yards for opponents. Um, passing touchdowns, 11 for UT Martin, 17 for opponents, 18 rushing touchdowns for UT Martin, only four for opponents. And um, you've got third down the conversions. Here's where UT Martin struggles. For as explosive as its, as its offense is, it struggles on third downs. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, 18 of 63 on the season, only 29% uh, for UT Martin on third downs. Opponents are converting third downs at a 35% clip. Uh, what about the offense? You got quarterback Dresser Wynn. He's a six-year guy. He's a pretty decent quarterback. Uh, 1,700 yards passing already this season, 11 touchdowns, two interceptions, completing at 63% of his passes. Uh, does have a rushing touchdown. Dresser Wynn is taking over for the Ohio Valley Conference Offensive Player of the Year last year, uh, Keon Howard, who left 
and uh, obviously due to graduation. But as Tressor wins show, and he's having a pretty good year. Um, in the backfield, the running back is kind of a two-man show. Only two guys received the bulk of the carries. Zach Wallace, 97 rushing attempts, 552 yards, 10 touchdowns. 5.7 yards per carry on the ground for Zach Wallace. His backup is Sam Franklin, 31 attempts, 393 yards, six touchdowns, 12.7 yards per carry. So that, that YPC looking really good for the backup running back, Sam Franklin. Uh, at wide receiver, Colton, Colton Dowell, 41 receptions, 581 yards, three touchdowns. Devontae Tanksley, 35 receptions, 531 yards, and a touchdown. Um, EJ Stouts, Three of his 14 receptions on the season have gone for six. The tight end, however, seems to be the go-to guy, especially in short yardage situations and in, in the red zone. Uh, four touchdowns on only 11 receptions on the season. So, you know, it's uh, it's it's a tight end friendly offense for Dresser Win. Uh, this offensive line has allowed just two sacks in six games preseason. Uh, the center, which I'm trying to find his name right here. Preseason, the center. Again, I had the notes. I had the notes. Center Matthew Hatchie was named a preseason uh, Lindy's All American. So that's uh, that. That's a note there. It's a pretty decent offensive line. Uh, defensively, it runs. You know, it's multiple it runs, a couple different variations, four two five a lot, and uh, you know, three four at times. Up front, Draylon Dotson's the guy to pay attention to. He leads the team with four and a half sacks. In the middle, they got two linebackers who are very productive. John Ford, 62 tackles. Rob Hicks, 61 tackles. But John Ford, 62 tackles, team leading. Six TFLs, team leading. Three and a half sacks and an interception. At cornerback, Sean Lewis has four interceptions. Uh, but again, this is a, there's a lot of opportunities through the air against that secondary. Um, and, and, you know, Hendon Hooker and Joe Milton really uh, should carve that up. So biggest thing I'm looking for tomorrow. That's the scout on UT Martin. It is what it is, okay? Uh, biggest thing I'm looking, get the uh, starters out of that football game as early as you possibly can. I've said it a couple of times already this year that, um, you know, what Tennessee does is you play the starters or the rotate, you know, the ones in with that group the entire first half and the first series of the second half. That's what Tennessee's done. We'll see if they do that. But again, Brent Hub said this earlier in the week, and I couldn't agree more. I think he said it on the Rocky Top Roundtable. You're in a different position now than you were against Akron, and then you were against Ball State. I mean, you look at the season, and <laughs> I mean everything's in front of you. You you you, you truly are a contender right now, so you, you you don't need to take any unnecessary risks. And so, I think as soon as you get up by a couple of scores, get Hendon Hooker out of that football game. It's important for Joe Milton to stay sharp, regardless. So, we will see what happens. Want to see a lot of Christian Harrison at quarterback. Want to see a lot and a lot of young running backs like Dylan Sampson, Justin Williams, Thomas, some walk-ons. Um, you know, we'll see. We'll see. Plus, there's going to be a lot of guys. If you even have a hint of an injury, do not play in this football game. That's why I think you're going to see a lot of reserves in the secondary on defense uh, and stuff like that. So, should be a fun time. That's coming up tomorrow at noon Eastern time. That'll be on the SEC Network. It'll be Tennessee against UT Martin. UT Martin four and two on the season. The Tennessee Volunteers, of course, six and zero. Oh. All right, that's gonna do it here for this edition of Locked On Balls. Can't thank you enough for hanging out with me here today. Um, we'll, uh, you know, obviously have uh, game day coverage. So follow the YouTube channel, of course. Follow us online at Locked On Balls, and follow me on Twitter at underscore Caner. Check out Locked On SEC. Make that your second listen, right behind Locked On Balls. Your first listen each and every day. It's a part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. All right, guys. Appreciate it. Same time, same place. We'll discuss everything on Monday. I'll have some clips coming out on YouTube over the weekend, so please subscribe there. Big thanks to Boogie Bentley and the boys for joining me, and thank you, as always, for hanging out with us here on Locked On Balls. Uh, you guys have a safe and enjoyable weekend, and we will talk again later on Monday.